Well, so glad you guys are here this morning. And um, uh, I, I would just want to apologize really quick. I bought a new shirt and it said wrinkle free. You ever get one of those guys in the tag and it's not wrinkle free. So uh, that's my bad, but don't judge me. Okay. Um, man, so thankful to be here. So here's what we're going to do. Um, just a quick side note. The last two weeks we did, Billy and I just did a little two-part series on generosity and would love, if you didn't get a chance to catch that message, it would be helpful to listen to those messages. And we have a gift for you if you stop by our Connect Space, uh, which is called The Treasure Principle. It's a little book written by Randy Alcorn uh, that just kind of walks through really what the Bible has to say about money, possessions, eternity, and a little bite-sized form. So just would encourage you to consider picking one of those up. If you didn't get one last week, it's our gift to you. Um, and just we want to be kingdom people with our finances as well. Um, But today what we're doing is uh, today and next Sunday as we kind of kick off the fall, uh, today is kind of like, hey, if you've got kids and, you know, K through 12, like this, like your summer's over. Like this is it. This is the last weekend. It all kicks into high gear. Some are relieved by that or like finally some are like, oh man, it's here. Depending where you are, there's grace for both. Um, uh, Next weekend though, uh, college students, I think, will be back in town, and so that's when our streets get a little more full. We love it. It's a lot of energy around here. Uh, restaurants are a bustle, and the uh, grocery stores usually out of out of food um, this coming weekend. So if you are a local and you're already here, go ahead and get your groceries now uh, before this weekend comes. But these two weeks, is, we're just going to take some time to look back a little bit and to celebrate our church because. In August of 2009 is when we started this church. So we're at 15 years, okay? So um, I'm gonna do my best to share some things today, but then we're gonna share uh, some more things next weekend. And so it's a little bit of a two-part because 15 years is a lot to put into 35 minutes, okay? All right, well, um, let me just start out by just sharing a little bit of history here. So in 1987, I was born in 82, so I didn't start the church in 87, okay? But... In 1987, um, the Antioch movement really uh, kind of birthed itself. Um, how that looked was in Waco, Texas. Um, a man named Jimmy Seibert and his wife, Laura, newlyweds and fresh out of college, um, they were at a church called Highland Baptist Church in Waco. And so Antioch really has a lot of its roots in Highland Baptist Church. And they were there and they um, had approached the elders and some of the leadership said, hey, God's put it on our heart. And they were part of the church. God's put it on our heart to start a training school where the local church could actually train people and send them out as missionaries. Now, in 1987, this was not a concept that really any churches or many churches in America had. It was very unique. The word church planting in 1987 was not really a thing. And usually you went through a missions agency, which still today, so Frontiers, Pioneers, YOM, the IMB, different missions agencies. Um, Usually if you had someone that said, hey, I want to go do mission work, you would connect them with one of those people. They would connect with them, train them, send them all that kind of stuff. And then they would come back once a year and give a talk or an update on what they're doing, right, on the work. And that's very normal. I grew up in church like that. But... As I started reading the Bible, Jamie and Laura and others said, hey, we believe that and what we see in the book of Acts is something a little different than maybe what's offered, which was it was through the local church they raised up people, made disciples, trained them, and then sent them out. So in 1987, they started their first little training school. I think it was seven or eight students. And more or less, it looked like this. Um, Five days a week, they did uh, 90 minutes of worship and prayer, 90 minutes of teaching, and 90 minutes of reading the Bible. <clears throat> and then they went the afternoon and did outreach and service projects. So it was pretty much like a five-day-a-week deal for most of the day, and then they all kind of worked night jobs on weekends just to make ends meet. It was hardcore. Okay, now we have a training school. It is not five days a week, six hours a day, um, but that's how it started. And they just said, listen, if we're gonna train people to go be missionaries in the nations, we're just gonna go all in. So they started out in the basement of Highland Baptist Church because they said, hey, there's a space you can start your little school there, right? So they started. Well, fast forward to 1999, and, um, you know, uh, for, I guess, what is that, 3, 9, 12, for 12 years, they had been running this training school within Highland Baptist Church and had been planting churches around the world. 
I can't name all the countries, but let's just say some of the countries that maybe you wouldn't just go vacation to um, are some of the countries they went to. Some very hard to reach countries, places to you can't really get into right now as an American so easily. And they would go because they wanted to go to the unreached people groups of the earth. That was the desire. It was, hey, we feel like calling to be a local, uh, to, to, to be a people, they're gonna go reach the unreached. So through the training school, that's what they did. They grabbed college students, young adults, families who had a desire calling for that, and they went. Well, when you get to 1999, they had recognized that, hey, this is going well, and God's got a, a leading on our heart to maybe go plant a church. And they had first thought about different places, but then in 1999, they approached the elders, talked it through with Highland, and worked their way through, and they finally got their blessing to go plant a church, and they actually planted in Waco. They thought they were going to go somewhere else, and they stayed in Waco. And when they, had, when they had prayed through it and talked to people, they said, man, you know, why do we need like another church here in Waco? And they said, well, what Waco needs is a church planting church, not just another church. So 99, they planted the church. And, um, and so there you go. So then all of a sudden now, which people always think about Antioch, we kind of did it backwards. We like did, we planted churches in other countries before we planted one in our country. It's kind of weird. And actually, I think Boston, Antioch Boston, was the first Antioch church in America. I think they were planted in like 98. Because some people came to the training school and they said, hey, we want to go plant a church in America. Let's go to the hardest place. Where's that? Boston. So they literally went to Boston. It's like one of the least church places in America and very challenging, right? And we're still there today, right? There's actually three or four Antioch churches in the Boston area still reaching people. Amen? So that started in 98. 99, Waco happens. All right, then I'm gonna fast forward to 2009, insert us, okay? There you go, that's a quick history. There's a lot more in there. Uh, I could do hours of message on it, but here's what I wanna share with you a couple things. Number one, um, during that season, there was a very clear word that was given to the leadership in Antioch from three different sources within the same week. So I think it was, one was from Scotland, one was from California, and someone at a conference not connected at all, and they all walked up to Jimmy and they gave him the same word. They said, the Lord is saying Isaiah 54, two and three. Someone woke up in the middle of the night. It was actually Joe Ewan. Anyone know Joe Ewan? Oh, yeah. He's our, our Scottish friend. So Joe, he called Jimmy in the middle of the night. This is you know back in the day, and he's like, Jimmy, I got a word for you. Isaiah 54, two and three. And Jimmy's like, I'm sleeping. You know, what is going on? Right, so, and then Jimmy walked it, he went to this conference and there was some random guy there who just walked up to him and started praying for him and said, the Lord's saying Isaiah 54, two and three. So usually when you get something three times, you're like, hey, maybe that is God, right? So let me read it for you. Isaiah 54, two and three. Enlarge the place of your tent. Stretch out the curtains of your dwellings. Do not spare them. Lengthen your ropes. Strengthen your pegs, for you will spread abroad to the right and to the left, and your descendants will possess nations and will resettle the desolate cities. You can read that in different translations, but more or less what it talks about is a people that are gonna be willing to go and to plant and to spread out and to reach and to reclaim and to revitalize and to say, man, we want God to move in a place that maybe seems desolate, desolate spiritually. We wanna go to the unreached. We wanna go. And so there's always been a call and a stirring for any of the Antioch people or churches to go, like that is part of who we are. There is a staying aspect and a going aspect that kind of live in tension with each other, right? And so some, some are gonna go for a season and then come back. Some are gonna stay for a season and then go. Uh, or some will always be going and some will always be staying. It doesn't matter, it's really what is God speaking to you and how has he wired you, leaned you, and what has he gifted you in? But that is a, that passage, Isaiah 54, two and three, is really a foundational scripture for the Antioch movement today that still stirs us. Now you may be asking, hey, you know, why are you called Antioch, right? And some of you know this, you've been here for a while, some don't. Why are we called Antioch? I remember when we first moved here, I'll get back to some of our story in a minute, but when we first moved here, I would go to people and say, they said, well, what are you guys doing? Well, we're starting a church. What's the church called? Antioch Community Church. And it's always funny because people who read the Bible like understand, they've like heard that term before, Antioch. I've read that somewhere in Acts or something like that. People who don't are like, what are you guys against? <laughs> I'm like, I'm not, we're not against. <sighs> and it's a city, like, where's that city? In tech? No, it's actually in Turkey now, but it's confusing. And Asia Minor, like, what are you talking? All right, you know, so you just kind of don't go down that trail. 
And every time I'd call customer service setting up accounts, you know, with like Sam's Club or something, they're like, can you spell that? And I'm like, Antioch. You know, so it's not a word we use all the time. So we were all of a sudden, when we started the church, we were a bit strange from the get-go. Like, why don't you get like a normal name? You know, they're like, we use every day. And it's like, no, we didn't do that. So Antioch, but where's that come from? Let me read to you something in Acts 11, two passages. The first one's Acts chapter 11, 19 through 24. Now, those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews. But, this is the big deal, verse 20, but there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who on coming to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists, also preaching the Lord Jesus. Those would have been the Gentiles, right? The Hellenist Greeks. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned to the Lord. The report of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas, remember Barnabas, to Antioch. When he came and saw the grace of God, he was glad, and he exhorted them all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, and a great many people were added to the Lord. Wow, that is our history. Now, we are not literally in modern-day Antioch. We're in Brian College Station. But that same spirit, that same heart, that same lineage is what we want to live out. We want people to say of us, hey, there's some good people over there full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. And by the way, the people around them are getting saved. People around them are getting redeemed. They're getting brought into the kingdom, right? We wanna, we wanna be a people that said, you know, here in verse 23, when he came and saw the grace of God, he was glad. Oh, we want that. Wow, we wanna see the grace of God on us as a people. People are like, man, we're glad to be around you. This is good. I'm getting some good vibes, right? That's what we're wanting. So that's Acts 11 kind of paints the picture of, Oh, this is where they started preaching the gospel to the Greeks, started preaching the gospel to the Gentiles, those who are not Jews. All of a sudden now, there's a breakout starting to happen. Let's continue on to verse 25 through 29 in the same chapter, Acts 11. So Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. For a whole year, they met with the church and taught a great many people. And in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. Now in these days, prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. And one of them named Agabus stood up and foretold by the Spirit there would be a great famine over the world. This took place in the days of Claudius. Verse 29. So the disciples determined everyone according to his ability to send relief to the brothers living in Judea. So here again, we see Antioch, we see this place where Barnabas goes to because he hears their faith, here's what's happening. He goes and gets Saul, which becomes Paul. He brings him back in the fold. And then what's he do? He spends what? A whole year with them. So if you're wondering, what's up with this Antioch training school, Antioch discipleship school? That's the concept. It's that simple. It's, well, huh, Paul went there for a year and trained them, discipled them, taught them. Maybe we could do something like that. Right, so we've actually got our own discipleship school and really every Antioch church in America and several of them overseas all have schools. Either they're small or big or maybe they run for half a year, a whole year, nights, days, there's different versions, but the heart is the same. How can we provide an environment to really train people up, not just to go do church planning, although there's some of that, but just to become more wholehearted disciples. I don't think that everyone that Paul talked to in Antioch for that year, all of a sudden left at the end of the year, right? Some did, and they went to go share it elsewhere, but many stayed and were stirred in their faith. So that is the premise and the heart behind the school that we have here. So here we go. We got Isaiah 54. We got Acts 11, giving you kind of our own Antioch movement and a little bit of the history. So let me back up and share with you a little bit about us, right, this church. Um, So... When we decided to, um, to move to Bryan College Station, it was a bit of a journey, um, and it really started back in the spring of 2008. 
Uh, I went out to lunch with, you may know Kevin Johnson. He's the director of Acts of Mercy now, globally, which is a, um, uh, we'll talk about that in a minute, but Acts of Mercy is an incredible organization that Antioch has birthed, and really it is disaster relief and crisis response and restoring people when there's things happening, earthquakes, tornadoes, all sorts of stuff. And Kevin took me out to lunch. He was an elder at Antioch Wake at the time, and, and we had a, a long discussion and essentially left it with, hey, We've been thinking about planting a church in Bryan Call Station for a number of years, and we were wondering if you guys want to be part of that. And I looked at him and I said, thanks for the offer, I'll think about it or something. And we, I got home and Ashley said, hey, how'd lunch go with Kevin? I said, oh, it went fine. And he said, what'd you talk about? And I said, I don't know, some ways they're just getting involved in the church and something about a church plant and whatever. And I went on, went on, went on, you know, with my day, right? And, um, you know, so I, I was like not that interested. And then it took about a four month journey um, of us wrestling through that to say, man, is this really for us or what? I never thought of ministry. I never actually wanted to do that. I just want to go to life group. You know, that's really it. <laughs> Pretty simple. Uh, maybe work with kids or something, the kids ministry. That's, that's about as far as I want to go. And, um, but the Lord had other plans. And so we went through that journey and eventually came around to, all right, we're gonna plant this church. And, um, and so we ended up moving here in the March of 2009. Ashley was 20 weeks pregnant with our oldest, Ethan. He's now 15. So it's kind of Ethan and the church kind of goes side by side. He doesn't like us saying that, but that's just the way it is. So, um, and, and so, you know, we, we got through this summer and just how the church started, I just wanna share this with you because I think it's important to know when we started out, we just did a few vision rallies uh, in March and April, which some people came to, whatever, and then the summer happened. And that first summer, 2009, uh, we, had, we had three things going on. We had a uh, everyone uh, over college age life group, and then we had college life group. The college life group had three to four people in it, and there's like three leaders, so it was a great ratio. <laughs> hey, I know your name, you know? Um, and then the young adult family one is actually the only time in our church really that it was like where the young adults families outnumbered the college. But that ended like two months later. So, um, but that's how it started. We just started meeting together. And then for Sundays, what we did is we met on Sunday nights because that's what we could find. And there's a little place across from Ainham's campus. And we meet there every two weeks, mainly because I was too chicken to preach every Sunday. L literally, I was like, I don't wanna do that. That's too much work. I'm just getting, I'm just figuring this whole preaching thing out. So we decided to do a service every two weeks. And then in the in-between, we just did a big party in the park. And so some of y'all were with us then. And so we would cook hot dogs, play kickball. I think we ran to Sam's Club and just got, you know, a bottle of water and drinks and whatever. And we just ate and hung out for like two or three hours of the park. Um, I think people probably liked the park thing more than the church thing for where we were at the time. We just weren't that great at what we were doing. Um, but it's great. And so our church is really built off of, hey, we're gonna eat food, play some games, and then we're gonna gather and worship, minister to each other, and then we'll do life groups. And that was it. It was super simple. Um, and then we got into the fall. And so in August 2009, we stumbled our way into the Hilton Hotel, which is a much longer story. But, but, um, but, but what I wanna tell you is as we started out, God reminded me of what we had prayed for when we were back in Waco. We'd gather with some people. We were praying for this church, right? Okay, Lord, what do you want to do? What do you want to say? And at Antioch Waco at the time, they had a 24-hour prayer room. And so a little push-button code, you go in there and you go in and we would pray. And, and we were in there. And when we were praying, we felt like the Lord gave us this, this, this vision, this picture, which was a clock, just like a clock, you know, 12, 1, 2, going all the way around. And on the clock, it had the hour hand at 11, and we were praying, like, Lord, what are you saying about that? And what we, what we sense God say was that, listen, I'm sending you to a people that are at 11 o'clock. They're stuck at 11. I want them to get to high noon. I want them to get vertical to me. They're so close. They're right there. But they're just a little off. And if, and, if, and if you think about it, if you're trying to go in a direction, you're trying to go 12 and you're at 11, early on, it's not going to seem like you're that far off. But over time, you're going to get real distant. And the Lord over and over over the years has always kept the scripture near and close, which is, um, <clears throat> you know, um, uh, uh, gosh, um, uh, uh, the narrow way. Help me out. I'm blanking on the scripture. Um, uh, those who find it will have, uh, oh my gosh. <laughs> eternal life. No, 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 not, not eternal, no, no. Um, um, the way is broad and easy that leads to destruction. The way is narrow and hard that leads to life, right? 
And so even throughout the years, we just thought through, okay, we're calling people to a narrow way. That's not popular. That's actually offensive. Who else called people to a narrow way? This is where you can do the Jesus. You just, that's all you just gotta, this is like the easiest answer you're ever gonna get. Just Jesus. I mean, you remember just, remember in like Sunday school, just say Jesus and you're probably right. Um, so that's what we did. And, and, and with that clock picture, it kept us say, hold on, man. Like, it's not that everyone at Bryan College Station is crazy. You know, like we are different. We are not Boston, you know? Like, like there are people that are, that are church. People have experience. You go to Boston or San Diego, people have never read a Bible. I mean, literally, they don't, they've never been there. They don't know anything, like some. In our town, we're still Bible Belt kind of folk, you know, even today's age. But what we sense was there's a lot of people that know about God. Maybe they just don't know him. There's a lot of people that have like heard about Jesus. Maybe they just, they don't have a relationship with it. There's a lot of people that maybe have questions about the Holy Spirit and they're just not sure what to do with that. There's a lot of people that are like saying, hey, at least we're not watching rated R. Maybe just PG-13 is okay. And, and their standards for Christianity is just based off of what they're, what they're viewing. And we realize, no, no, there is a higher narrow way for people to live off of. But we've got to call them to that. So we started the church really calling people to this higher way. Another word the, the Lord gave us, a vision was, as we looked at Texas A&M, we really sensed that the Lord spoke and said, hey, this is a sleeping giant. Like literally a sleeping giant that has been lulled to sleep over years and just kept just at this kind of lukewarm Christianity or kind of cultural Christianity kind of a thing. People always talk about ain't in such a conservative campus, and you know maybe if you think in terms of like voting or something, maybe. But but in terms of like walking the ways of the kingdom, I went to AM and I know where I was at, and you know I knew the people that are around me, and it's like yeah, we kind of kept the standards. We we kept from getting arrested, you know. We didn't curse a lot. We didn't get drunk. We like you know turned our assignments in. Didn't really cheat. You know, kind of the basic morals. But we didn't go above and beyond. And I don't think that Jesus called his disciples just to do the basic morals. He called them to something greater. Something he's gonna cost them, maybe cost them everything. So we looked at AM and said, okay, Lord, we're gonna go after that campus. Now, just so you know, that's not a great church planning strategy. You don't really, um, you don't get many offerings that way. Um, you, it, you end up having hundreds and hundreds of people and then you're like super understaffed, not really sure what to do with them. And then they're only here like nine months out of the year. So then like every holiday, you just like don't have a service. I mean, literally like for years, we were just like Memorial Day, not doing that. Christmas Eve, no one's here. Easter's our smallest Sunday of the year, which is weird because you're like Easter, Super Bowl for churches. Like you probably, your home church, they're like seven services. Here we're like, can we pull off a service for Easter? Because everyone left. And then if you're a young adult, you weren't from here anyways, you just went back home. And so it was like, you know, us. It was like, all right, here we are. There's 20 of us, you know, kind of doing our thing. And it was so interesting. So it was such a backwards way, but I wouldn't trade it. I wouldn't trade it. The thousands of college students we've had a chance to minister to and walk with, some of you were in college when you came to this church. I wouldn't trade it. Because we never came here to build anything for ourselves. We came here to reach people who are hungry. And whether you're young or old, it doesn't matter. If you're hungry, we wanted to feed you. If you're looking for something more, we wanted to call you to that. If you're looking for something easy, you probably didn't stay at Antioch very long. Someone told me years ago, they said, um, they said, the thing about Antioch is you can't really stay there for more than six months if you're not willing to change. And I liked that. I was like, you know, thank you. That's actually, incur that's a great Google review. You better change it in six months or else you should just not go. And again, it's not changed because we just want you to, be, it's like, you're gonna have to start conforming your life around this. And you're gonna start walking by the spirit because we can't just, we can't just live just going off a list of do's and don'ts. We've gotta live, live by the spirit. We've gotta walk with Jesus. So we started the church in 2009 and man, if only I had time, which is why I got next week too to share with you more, but we had amazing things happen. And, um, you know, what, what I wanted to do is just to share um, 
a couple of, uh, just a couple of highlights, just so you know, just some of our history so you can know, hey, what you're a part of, okay? So, um, you know, when we first started out, we're at the Hilton Hotel, and um, so we got a picture for that, I don't know. And um, we had our services there in the Oakwood Ballroom. It kind of stair-stepped down. It was super cool. There's our big screen we set up. So every Sunday, we just rolled in with the big cargo trailer, unloaded at 5 a.m. or 6 a.m., whatever it was, got all sweaty, put our sound up. You see a little banner? We love that banner. It just said a passion for Jesus' purpose. We had that banner for years. And people finally were like, dude, you gotta get rid of the banner, you know? Um, we had this little vinyl banner we had, all that little drapery. I think Matthew Stewart, wherever he is, he helped me. We put that together. We filled up concrete buckets of five-gallon buckets of concrete and brought them in for a little pole PVC pipe thing. It was classic, okay? It was like a 1980s church feel. Um, but that, that was us, okay? So, so we, would, we would just, we were, you know, we didn't know what we were doing. We just said, we're gonna worship, teach, maybe do some announcements, pray for each other and see what God does. And so with even, without much of a plan, we just went for it. And God started adding to our number. We'd have people stay at the Hilton who just popped down like, I don't know that Hilton has a church, you know? And they just walked in. There's a Starbucks at the Hilton. And so they had great coffee. We never served coffee, just, you know. I think like for Parents Weekend one time, it was terrible. Um, we never did coffee because there was a Starbucks, you know, it was great. But we're at the Hilton, we're like, okay, when people are getting saved, we're like, wait, we need to baptize people. How are we gonna do that? Go to the next slide. So the Hilton actually has a pool and a hot tub. Uh, no, no, not that one. Go to, the, go to the one with the pool and the hot tub one. Um, so, you know, the Hilton, we were like talking one day, how are we gonna do this? And people said, we wanna get baptized. So we just, after the service, marched out after the service, the whole group of us down the hallway into the hot tub and just started dunking people. Uh, and that just became the norm. And so we just, and so people, the balconies of the Hilton, they would kind of look over and be like, what's going on down there? People would kind of watch these baptisms and it was rowdy. And we just kind of said, listen, we're gonna be loud and crazy because we're gonna celebrate someone getting baptized. It wasn't gonna be this like golf clap thing or snapping fingers. It was gonna be like, this is awesome. So we went for it. So we baptized in the hot tub when it was cold. When it was hot out, we went in the pool. We did some massive like 15 person baptisms in the pool at the same time. It was great, okay? So we loved it. Um, so the church is growing, things are happening. We went from a college life group of three people in that summer to, I think there's a slide of that, go back to that one, the living room picture, um, to where we've got, I don't know, it was like 70 something college students in our living room and it was packed out and, and it was great. And a lot of them were just trying to figure things out, but man, we just, we just crammed in and just started sharing uh, testimonies and people being vulnerable and studying the word and worshiping with each other. And it was amazing. And then it grew and multiplied. And, and that really was how our church was birthed in many ways was in the house. It was in life groups. It was just, how are we gonna start reaching people? And people were hungry. They wanted to be called. Not everyone stayed, of course, but people who were hungry and they were committed to saying, hey, we wanna be part of what is happening here. So that was 2009 and um, just, you know, it was such a fun, fun year. Um, you know, and, and then of course we planted the church, we're thinking, hey, we wanna be a missional people, right? Um, and so in 2010, there was an earthquake that hit um, Haiti and it was, uh, I think, a 7.0 magnitude. It devastated the country and so we kind of scrambled and a few of us, a team, we went down there to Haiti. And soon afterwards, Antioch started sending teams there like all year round to help, uh, initially doing a bunch of medical things and then we went down there and we went in these tent cities in these villages because all the buildings were, were literally rubble. So we went to the soccer stadium and, and what they did is they started going to these areas and people just put up these like tarps because they didn't feel safe to be in a building anymore. You know, if the building had just collapsed and killed a lot of people you know, you wouldn't want to get in a building either. So they lived in tents. And so this is like seven months later still after the earthquake and this is how people are living. We just went there and shared with them and loved on them. And um, we had to translate from English to, I think it was, uh, what was it? Uh, English to French to French Creole or something like that. And it was wild, but we saw people came to faith. People um, were delivered of demonic things. People were healed of little physical uh, healings of, of, of different ailments that they had. And we got to love on the kids and the adults and it was powerful. It did something in us. It just said, okay, this is who we are as the people, as the church. Um, you know, as, as we started out again, you know, we had these college students and said, okay, what are we gonna do? And it was that first spring break. This is 2010 spring break. And we said, well, you know, we should do a mission trip. But it was like, I, I don't know, maybe two weeks or three weeks before spring break. It was not very planned. Um, 
So we're like, hey, anyone don't have spring break plans, you know? So we were like, great, we're gonna do a mission trip here. And so talk about a hard sell. You live here all the time. Now on spring break, don't go anywhere, stay here. Pay some money and let's go do outreach. But you know, we got 40 people do it. It was amazing. It was like, I don't know, a third of our call students. It was crazy. And it, I loved it. We went to restaurants. We're praying for waitresses. People are getting healed and saved. We're getting kicked out of Walmart by security because we're sharing the gospel. We're going to Target. They're like, our customers are crying. Why are you, what are y'all doing? You know, it's like, well, you know, it's not us. It's the, it's the spirit. What are we doing? You know, it was wild. We go to Northgate on Thursday night and it's like, let's go find as many drunk people as you can and love on them and pray for them. It's like, we just, it was like the wild west, you know, because we didn't care. Like we, we just, hey, we're at 11, we're trying to get to 12. You don't, you, you, don't, you, know, you don't get there with like baby steps. You gotta be bold. And so we were bold and so we got a lot of flack for it. I can't even tell you all the rumors we had about us, which would probably make you laugh. Maybe we should do a whole night of rumors. Um, <laughs> I mean, it was, I mean, some, some were like, ooh, cringe. Some are like, that is really funny. I wish that was us, but that's not us. I mean, that's hilarious. Um, but, you know, that's what you do when you start something, when you birth something from nothing, and when you trust God, there's gonna be ups and downs, right? Just like when you start a family, there's gonna be ups and downs. You can read as much as you want on, like, planning to have a baby and the sleep patterns. We did all that, and we're gonna, you know, have this whole plan, and then tell me about that plan two years later. Like, yeah, that, that, went, that kind of didn't go out so well, right? You can do all the premarital counseling you want, but it's one thing to be premarital counseling, another thing to actually be married. And it's like, well, this, they didn't tell us about that thing. You know, it's like, we gotta work that one out, right? And, and so that is what it is, and so we worked it out together, and the grace of God was with us, I firmly believe, and I believe that for a few reasons. One, because... The power of God was with us. We were in faith. We were believing for things that were impossible. We were believing for signs and wonders and miracles. Even though it didn't always happen, even though we got mocked by it, even though it made fun of, questioned, in this town, it's like, I don't know, guys, this is what the Bible says, and I've seen stuff overseas, and we're believing for stuff here. So you don't have to believe that. That's fine. You can be in the camp of not believing that. Sounds good. But I, I, I would rather go to my grave believing then go to my grave doubting. I don't know. So that's offensive to some people, but that's how we lived, you know? And, but when you're going for things, man, it's, it's a little messy and clunky, but man, we had so many incredible stories. Um, I wish I had more time to share a bunch of them with you just th th this morning, but let me share a few more things with you, then we'll wrap it up. Um, you know, as we were going um, forward as the church and, you know, we started our discipleship school, it was amazing. I think I had a picture of maybe our first class of which Christy Martin was part of that class. Um, there they are. There's the team. And um, that was our first discipleship school. And, you know, they kind of went for it. And it was a bit wild, you know. And, uh, but, but, they, but they committed for a year to read the Bible and memorize scripture and, and go through stuff. And we're so proud of them. And it was amazing, because for us, it was like a big hallmark. And I was like, we have a training school, yes! Like, we're legit, you know? Uh, and it, it, it was amazing. Um, you know, as we, as we moved along, um, as, our, as our church grew, we got to two services at the Hilton, and all sorts of stuff was happening there. But then you got to, um, we got to the point where we just couldn't meet there anymore. Uh, so then there's a longer story behind it, but we were able to get into this space in February 2013. So we've been in this space for, I don't know what that is, uh, 11 years, something like that. And, um, and, and, and it's been great. A previous church had this space. They renovated it. We did some things to it. We busted out the wall that way and that way. If you ever look at that brown line in the carpet, that's where a wall used to be. If you look at the tiles, how they kind of go weird over here, that's where a wall used to be. You're sitting in the previous coffee shop. You're sitting in the hallway right there. You guys are in the sanctuary, you know? Um, <laughs> but, but, you know, all, all that said, there's little stories along the way, but, but the main thing that we were going after was, okay, Lord, how can we just be a people that are gonna devote ourselves to you? How can we simply do this? How can we love God, love one another, and live on mission as a people? How can we love you? So Lord, how can we help people know how to know you and walk with you in the devotional life? How do we come alongside them in discipleship and life group? And it's messy at times, it's not clean, it's not perfect. I don't think Jesus's ministry was like perfect with everyone around him. It's, he was perfect, but not everybody around him. 
And I think it's the same thing for the church, but we walked it through and people's marriages have been restored. We've done all sorts of things from helping pay off debt of $40,000 to $100,000 to, I mean, surprising a, a, a family with a minivan and life group. Hey, here's a minivan. They're like, whoa, what in the world? To people selling their cars to help out somebody else to, I mean, all sorts of crazy stuff in terms of generosity, in terms of healing, in terms of people staying up all night. Um, to pray with someone. We've done, life groups have prayed and fasted for, for I remember w- one year we had a, a gal, her parents were on the verge of divorce and her college life group pulled together and said, hey, we're gonna do a prayer and fast for three days to see breakthrough for your parents. And you know what happened? There was breakthrough for her parents. Like it was literally, they were like, it's on the way out and they just prayed and fasted. These college students said, no, we're gonna believe God's gonna put a stop to that and changed it. And it's like, wait, that just, that just happened. Right, and so all of a sudden, people when they start experiencing miracles, they're like, "Wait, this is for real." So really, the issue is not God; it's us. Uh, he's not the problem. He's ready and waiting. He's ready to roll, <laughs> but he's looking for people that are going to believe and trust him and go after it. And even if they get rejected, or even if they pray for someone's headache to get healed fifteen times, they don't see it. They're going to go for number sixteen. Right? If they share the gospel with someone three different times, maybe they won't give up. Maybe they keep praying for them and try again. It was a people who were determined. And so over the years, I want you to know that's just a few pieces of our history and foundation. And we're gonna share more next week, but I, I want you to know that we're still dialing back in to the simplicity of, okay, Lord, you've given us a word. We're part of the Antioch movement, Isaiah 54. Lord, we wanna be the people of Antioch. We want there to be a grace upon us. Uh, we want to be... Uh, people that have favor. We want to see people reached and transformed. We want to be filled with the Spirit. We want to be a, a, a grounded people. And, Lord, we want to love you, <laughs> simply put. How do we love you now in 2024? What's it look like? Lord, what's it look like for our kids to love you? What's it look like for our youth to love you? Our college, young adults, families, like, what's it look like? Or what's it look like to love one another? You know, our church, just like many churches in society, got... Um, you know, society got more divisive in 2020, right? Um, and I, I don't know if we're more or less divisive now. I'm not sure. But what I know is that the church was not meant to be divisive. The church was meant to, place, to be a place of spirit of unity and healing. And whatever our brokenness is, we work that through and we forgive and we, and we extend grace and we move on. Um, and I think that's what God's calling us to. He's calling us to love him again simply to love one another, to really love one another, which means to believe the best, to honor, to encourage, to, to love one another, and to be missional people. When there's, a, when there's an issue that happens, we respond. Whether it's in-house, a crisis, a challenge, or somewhere in our nation or overseas, we can respond to, that's our heart. And that's who we wanna be as a people. Um, I'm gonna go invite the band up this morning as we get ready to close, and why don't you guys go and stand with me this morning. Um, You know, I just wanted to share as, as we're kind of going into the fall semester again, um, you know, Ashley and I, we, uh, the other day, just a couple nights ago, we drove over to the Hilton Hotel and we popped into the Oakwood Ballroom, which is where we used to have our services and they're like renovating the space. We took a little selfie photo and uh, just stood there for a minute and just realized, man, that was a long time ago. Um, a lot's changed. Um, but what hasn't changed is he hasn't changed. Um, he's still the same. Um, he's still looking for people that are gonna be committed to the great commandment and the great commission. And there's other churches doing that. We're just one of them. I would like to say that um, we just wanna, we wanna be where the action is <laughs> and we just wanna do our slice of the kingdom. I look at the kingdom of God as a big pizza pie, right? I just just a slice. If it's a tiny slice, I'll take it. If it's a big slice, sounds great. I need Grace Bible Church to do their slice. I need Blake Chilton at uh, uh, Declaration to do his slice. I need Jonathan Brooks at Restoration to do his slice. I need Brian Fisher at Grace to do his slice. I need Philip Betancourt at Central to do his slice. I need these pastors that I just had lunch with on Thursday. We do a monthly pastor's lunch. I need them to do their slice, to do their part. There's 20-something pastors at this luncheon. We had a, a, a pastor from, um, from the Orthodox Church the first time he came, from the Lutheran Church, Methodist Church, Bible Church, Baptist Church, Presbyterian Church, Pentecostal Church, Antioch, we're not really sure what we are, right? We're our own thing. 
But you, you know what was sweet about that fellowship? When I came 15 years ago, that was not happening at all. At all. They would all tell you, no, 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 there was a lot of division in the city. But over the years, relationships started being cultivated. Not just amongst the pastors, but the people. And all of a sudden, people started realizing, wait, why are we, why are we fighting against each other? There, there is an enemy. His name's the devil. He is out to steal, kill, and destroy. That's not our goal. <laughs> That's his goal. We're here to bring life. We're here to take people from 11 to high noon. We're here to wake up a sleeping giant. We're here to meet the needs of others. We're here to drive to Temple and back to sit next to Christy. We're here to show up to Life Group and pay off someone's debt. Like we're here to stay up late from 8 p.m. to midnight doing prayer ministry with someone because they need breakthrough and deliverance in their life. We're here to help somebody move in because they've got a lot of stuff to move and there's only one of them to do it. <laughs> we're the church. That's who we are. If you don't hear anything else today, hear this. We simply want to be the church of the book of Acts. And that's a long book, but just read it. We're not there. That's where we're going. That's where we're going. So we have imperfections. So do I. My shirt's wrinkled. There's one. But I don't think that God is moving the church forward by our criticisms or division or doubt. He's gonna move us forward in faith. So if you're doubting this morning, let's put that to, to, to faith. Lord, stir me again. Believe, Lord, help me believe again. Some of you in this room, I know you have known you for a long time. You need a stirring again. You need to say, hold on a second. I was on fire before. What happened? That's okay. Time goes. He's still on fire. You just got to tap back in. You don't actually have to go back to college to get on fire. Like it's the same God was lighting you up then that can light you up now. Some of you have just come. You're like, man, I didn't know this thing about Antioch. I'm still kind of unsure about it. That's okay. But I'm going to encourage you to jump in the river at some point and get your feet wet. So that's going to be a little nervous. That's gonna be, it should. It should make you uncomfortable to walk the narrow road. It ain't easy. Jesus said, few find it. I want you to find it. I want to, I believe I found it and I want to stay on it. <laughs> and I'm being tempted every week to get off it. Because the devil is like a prowling lion at the door trying to pull you off that narrow road. Don't let him. And we're trying to take others that are stranded, that are going 11, 10, 2. Hey, hold on, hold on, man. Here's the narrow road. Can I, lead, can I help you? Can I show you what this is like? That's my heart for us this morning is that we'd be a people that are gonna be committed to being just like the early church in the book of Acts. Let's pray this morning. Lord, oh, Lord, we thank you. Lord, stir our hearts again. Lord, we need to be stirred. Lord, no matter what it looks like, Lord, even if whoever's here this morning, if this is the last time you come to Antioch or it's your first time, I don't know. Lord, we don't care. We just want people to follow you, to be um, walking down the narrow way and finding life in you and fulfilling what it is you have for them. Lord, I pray we'd be a, we would be a great commandment people and a great commission people at the same time. Let it be, Lord. Let us be a great commandment people and a great commission people, Lord. Let us live those two things in tension. Let us be a people who worship in spirit and truth, God. Let us extend grace and mercy and be willing to share the truth. Lord, we love you. We thank you. We welcome you in this place. We thank you for 15 years of faithfulness. You have taken care of us. You have healed us, provided for us, done miracles. You have saved us. You have transformed us. You've renewed us, Lord. You have reclaimed us. You have awakened us to life out of a place of death. So, Lord, we pray there'd be more of that. Lord, let it multiply, Lord. Let these stories be, be the stories of the, of the past, but give us new ones, Lord. Give us fresh testimonies this fall. Give us a new stirring, Lord. We're believing God for more. So, Lord, would you come? Would you come stir us up as a people? No matter where we live or what we're doing, we'd be focused and committed to you, Lord, to the very end, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. We're just gonna worship together this morning. Thank you, Lord.